Today in this video, I'm joined by Valerie Sly, our principal horn of the Alabama Symphony Orchestra. Say hi. Hello. And we're gonna talk about articulation and what articulation sounds like when you're up close to somebody versus what it sounds like in the hall. Ryan thought it'd be interesting to play some excerpts from one of our most recent concerts uh, where we did Tchaikovsky's Sixth Symphony. And he put a mic on stage and one in the hall so that you can hear the difference between what he's actually doing, what we're all hearing on stage, and what comes across in the hall. So what I tried to do here is play one version where it sounded nice next to me and one version the way that I would actually play it in the orchestra so we can hear the difference. We're gonna start with that recording's on the actual stage. And this one we're gonna start with is the, I guess, nicer version. So what are your thoughts right out of the gate? Yeah, I mean, with the mic right next to you, I think it sounds really good. The fronts of the notes sound really clean. It doesn't sound overly articulated. And I think if I was listening to somebody play, you know, 20 feet away from them or something like that, and I heard that, I would be like, yeah, that sounds right. So now let's listen to the version that more resembles what I actually did when we performed it. You gotta keep in mind context when you're performing anything. And so when you hear this, it may sound much more aggressive, but in the context of the piece, there's so much happening that to be able to articulate like this allows the trumpet to really come to the forefront of the texture. So let's take a listen. What'd you think of that version? Yeah, I mean, that definitely sounds closer to what I hear on stage all the time. I think you can definitely hear the difference in the articulation. It definitely sounds like you're putting a lot of front on the notes. But when I hear that next to me, or, you know, 20 feet away from me, I get so much clarity from it about how I should play, where I should be placing things. There's a percussiveness to it that's super, super helpful for the rest of the brass section to really show us time to show us sound and all of that kind of thing. If you were playing in a small space and you were playing like that, I might think maybe you could dial it in a little bit. Yeah, it's for me, it's kind of surprising to listen to it. You know, when you record yourself, you know, you have an idea of what you sound like on your side of the bell. And so to actually hear the differences between the two versions is very illuminating for me. Let's now listen to the recording in the hall of each version of it and see what takeaways that we might have. The first one we're gonna listen to is the lesser one with the not as aggressive articulation. Yeah, that's super interesting. It just sounds mushy. Mm -hmm. It sounds a little mushy to me, and it doesn't have that energy through the line or through the front of the note that it had when you listened to it on stage. How far away is the mic in this one, in our hall? Uh, this is at the very back, where the right in front of the mezzanine. Okay. So it's not underneath the mezzanine. It's probably 40 rows back. Something like that, maybe? Sort of middle of the ground floor. Mm -hmm. So it's not even as far back as you would be, like... If, if you, you were in the nosebleeds. In the nosebleeds no, or definitely if you were, not. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a really big difference, and it just... You really lose the energy in the front of the notes, and, and I can see how... Like, if you imagine the whole brass section is playing here, I can just imagine that with 
you trying to cut over all of these other people who are doing slightly different rhythms, all kinds of different things going on, plus the rest of the orchestra. It just really would sort of fade into the texture, I think. Mm. One of my philosophies, I guess, as a principal trumpet is that above all things, the rhythm that I play with is the most important thing. Obviously, you want a great sound, you want great intonation, but being able to play with very good rhythm, I guess, or exact rhythm, as close as you can get to that, and then being able to play in such a way that that rhythm is clear, I really think can act as a traffic cop, kind of, in a lot of very difficult or uh, rhythmically nebulous areas. Or when there's just so much stuff going on, it's hard to hear, to be able to hear that. So I've, I find that to be a job of mine that I take very seriously. And so let's listen to the version of it that would more reflect how I actually played it in the concert. your thoughts. <laughs> <laughs> Why are you laughing? It's just so funny. It's like, to me, when I hear that versus the first version, I just go, yeah. Yeah, I mean, me too. Yeah, that's it's not, like, that oh, that right. sounds, that's good. That, I like that. Yeah, that sounds right. It also has a completely different color to it. It has a different sound. It has a completely different vibe to it, which I think is really appropriate for this section. Mm -hmm. um, especially this is the Pathetique Symphony. This is a very passionate moment. And I think the first one, when we listened to it, was sort of like, yeah, that sounds nice. Sure. This one sounds, you know, we're going somewhere. So maybe the difference between the first one was just a really nice trumpet player, and the second one was this is more the emotion of the moment. Yeah, and I think it's like really important to talk about this, especially when you're thinking about auditions, because it sounds more correct, but it doesn't sound louder, mm -hmm. not like decibel-wise, right? It sounds more intense. It sounds more engaged and like there's more line, but it's not. it doesn't sound like you're just blasting the heck out of it, right? It doesn't sound like too much. Mm -hmm. And I think it's really important to, for us to talk about in the context of auditions or in, in the context of different types of playing, what does it mean when we see fortissimo? Does it always mean the same thing? I don't think so. And does it always mean decibels or does it also mean style, color, articulation, all of these other things. So I think you could play this version and you could even take, you know, a little bit of the decibels down and you could create the same effect without having to play super loud. And I think that's a really, really important skill because sometimes, depending on the orchestra, we have conductors going like this and we have to be able to create the, the correct environment the correct character in our playing without like detached from the volume right that mm -hmm. that those two things don't always go together yeah yeah this is an exercise that i do with students and do myself a lot where i'll take you know fortissimo especially section excerpts that you know extended fortissimo excerpts and i'll record myself playing them like mezzo piano and the goal that i'm trying to achieve is that they sound totally right, but just like you turned the dial on the volume down. So can I create everything about a fortissimo atmosphere or the character that I'm trying to achieve in this excerpt, but at a lower decibel level, but everything else is the same. And it's that's an exercise that I love so much because it makes you think about all of these other parts of color. We wanted to share one more section from Tchaikovsky's Sixth Symphony. It's from the fourth movement where you have the trumpets and trombones and horns and other parts of the orchestra going back and forth on this passionate melody that becomes more and more animated until you have kind of an explosion of sound basically at the end of it. And I wanted to do this because it's got tenudos over it. And I wanted to try to talk about tenudos and how to think about doing them. Maybe you wanna share what your thoughts are on Tenuto and how to effectively get this character or this articulation marking out into the hall. Sure, do you wanna to listen to it first and then maybe we'll talk about the sure. 
the articulation. All right, so let's take a listen on stage first, and then we'll do the hall version. Now let's listen to it in the hall. That was the less articulation one, right? Both of those were how I would normally play it. Oh, so okay. interestingly, I feel like I didn't quite do it as well as I would have liked to. When it got to the forte and the fortissimo, I thought I did a better job at placing the notes, mm -hmm. but it was a little bit chewy down in the low register on those particular recordings. So I could have done this better, it looks like. Yeah, I think you get the point, though. Um, it's sort of the same thing in the hall, I feel like... Um, it just doesn't sound like too much front to me on the notes, especially when you think about it in the context of lots of different instruments playing this. This section, the horns have it too, and the way that I kind of think about these tenutos, there are a lot of different ways, I think, to, to play tenutos depending on the context. But for me, in this section, you want a really clear front to the note, but then you want no decay. So if you were doing accents, it would kind of look like strong front and then triangle-shaped back of the note. And here I think of it more as a, a very square note so yeah. that you're really not getting decay when you go into the next note. So you get this sort of wall of sound and it feels like it has a lot of line. I thought you did a nice job of that, especially in the beginning. But I wanted, particularly wanted you to play this one because I think sometimes when we think about articulating strongly, we always think of it in the context of like an accented yeah. or a fortissimo passage or something like that. But there are a lot of different contexts where we really want a very clear front of the note, especially when you're trying to rise above a whole orchestra. Um, so I, I don't know, I think you did a nice job of that. I don't know how you practice that, but um, when I'm trying to get to that kind of healthy articulation, I do a lot of breath attacks mm. so that I can really, really practice having a f like fully supported airstream as soon as the articulation releases the note. Do you want to listen to one more? Yeah. Okay. This is, we're just going to do just the hall on this one. This is when the march in the third movement finally becomes realized. Then you have a very long hall of just playing loud for a long time. And all the dynamics are two Fs and three Fs. I don't know about you, but the trumpets have one part that's four Fs towards the climax of that part. So it's like, A, how do you make a difference between these two, three, and four F dynamics? And then B, how do you sustain that as one individual? You know, how do you make sure that you're gonna be strong all the way to the end? Well, for me, articulation is a huge part of that. So let's first listen to the version of it where I'm not uh, tonguing quite as hard. I want it to sound nice as if you were sitting close to me. do that like 30 more times <laughs> right okay now let's listen to the version of it where i'm playing it more like the way i would play it i'm not thinking of playing louder i'm just trying to tongue harder or with more energy or with a crisper articulation lots of different ways you could say the same thing
pretty clear difference between those yeah. two as well. I mean, that one sounds like a lot still in the hall to me, but I think you also have to remember that everyone is in rhythmic unison pretty much in the orchestra at this point. And so strings are doing, I think, single bows on each note. Everybody's doing this together. So there's going to be, you know, an element of mush. I sure, think. sure. In the orchestra, when everybody's doing it together, you just lose a little bit of that um, absolute, like, precise front to the note. And so there have to be people in the orchestra who are providing that. Sure. I like the idea of you being like the traffic cop. A little bit. A little bit. Um, yeah, I yeah. think percussion is a little bit like that sometimes. Principal trumpet's a little bit like that sometimes. I think it works, especially in that context. So that's the end of the examples that we have for this video. I know we've talked about a lot of different things in this, but do you have any sort of succinct-ish takeaways that would be good for you or things that you think someone watching this video might think about uh, related to this topic we've been discussing. Yeah, I just think, you know, as brass players in general, you know, I practice 90% of the time in my living room. I think most students are practicing 90% of the time in small practice rooms. And when you're close to a wall, when you're in a small space, you're going to get a lot of pop back at you. And so I think a lot of times we um, temper our articulation based on that. And it actually is very harmful, right? It makes you stop moving your air in a healthy way at the beginning of notes. It makes you kind of pull back on on everything. And so I think it's just a nice reminder. Like it's a nice reminder for me to listen to this that actually we can place a lot of importance on making sure that we get the air behind the articulation right up front. And I think even when you have, you know, a nasty pianissimo high entrance or something like that, we don't want to shy away from the pop of the note. Because if if we try to swallow that pop, we're not going to move our air well. We're not going to be supporting the back of the note. So it's nice to hear this in the hall and remember that like we don't have to hide the articulation as much as we sometimes think we do. The articulation is a, a really important part of the shape of our notes as brass players. So I think that's gonna be all for this particular video. I think we were already discussing a part two of this with listening to horn, because if you add the horn bell going in the wrong direction, it may just exacerbate this whole discussion even more. If you have anything you want us to talk about in a future video, leave that down in the comments, or if you have any questions or thoughts or anything like that on on this particular video, also leave that down below. We'd love to hear from you. Thank you so much for joining me on this particular video. It was fun to dig in. We've been talking a lot about how to perform music as an orchestral trumpet player, but if you don't understand how to practice in a good way, it's not gonna make any difference. So if you wanna see how I approach my practice sessions, click the video on the screen. We'll see you in the next video. Horn does not face the wrong direction. It's just a different direction. All right.